good hello again to whoever does decide to uh, listen slash watch this thing, which I have, for some reason, called uh, Talkie Time. Because why not? Now, before we actually get into today's subject, which is Franz Fanon and uh, psychology and uh, colonization, I must first say that um, there might be some sound issues as it is raining, and also I have birds living in my roof, and so they make some noise sometimes, as you might imagine. So, first off, apologies for that. Second of all, let's talk about Fanon himself. So, Franz Fanon was a, he died quite young, first of all. Uh, he died only at the age of 36, and he has left behind an extremely uh, influential set of books, uh, especially two of those books, which we will be getting into. We'll be getting into four of his books, but we'll get to that. Um, so, he is extremely influential in the post-colonial um, tradition, essentially, post-colonial uh, academic tradition. And specifically, he looked at, a lot of the time, the political issues and also psychiatric issues of colonized people and also colonizer people. Now, he himself was from uh, a place called Martinique, which is a, oh, well, was a French colony, although they now call it a French department because it is still effectively a colony of France, although now they changed the word around, you know, uh, this has been done before where, you know, uh, a country will say, oh, no, no, we, we, we don't, we don't have a, um, you know, it's not a colony. No, no, it's a, it's a protectorate or it's a, uh, uh, a, a mandate or it's a, a territory. They don't like to use the word colony anymore because, you know, it's fallen out of favor. But at the time when he was born, it was very much a colony. So this was a French colony in uh, Martinique, which is in uh, the West Indies, which is in the Caribbean. The reason it's called the West Indies is because, you know, it's the same naming convention that they decided for some reason to call Native Americans Red Indians because they just went, oh, well, obviously we, they're Indian people, so we're just going to call them that. And the name just stuck for some reason. Uh, and the West Indies are the same. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's the India to the West, which, you know, you, you could say it's actually to the east of India. So it's a bit wrong. But I suppose everything is relative. But whatever. It's the usual nonsense uh, colonizer names for things. And this is also why Franz Fanon, a black man, is called a West Indian, which is anyone from the, the West Indies, which is actually quite a, a sort of a multiracial group, but they're just called West Indians. I don't know if that term is actually still used. I would hope not. Uh, it seems, it, it sounds like something that would be kind of offensive, but he is the only real man who I have uh, uh, academic connection with. And so I don't really know much about Martinique and French, uh, the French, uh, French West Indies and you know, uh, so-called West Indians. So I can only speak from that particular uh, knowledge set. Now, today we are going to be talking about four of his books, although we are going to be doing it in a weird order because um, <laughs> I decided to do it out of order. In just uh, my own my own order, um, how I would prefer to approach it. Now he, born in a colony, so of course he's born in a colony. He's a black man in a French colony, and so he is a colonized person. He ends up studying in France, where he does experience a lot of discrimination, and it is actually where he does um, sort of formulate a lot of his early ideas. And then he ends up moving to Algeria, where he is positioned there as a psychiatrist. And he helps, or he works with both colonizers and colonized people. And eventually he ends up joining the FLN, the Front de Libération Nationale, or uh, in English, it's, you know, the, uh, actually see what this would be called in English, uh, in English, National Liberation Front. Um, so yeah, the FLN, and that is pretty much where he ends up spending a lot of his time working with trying to overthrow French colonial rule in Algeria, and he ended up becoming seen as somewhat of a hero in Algeria uh, for his work and his writings. He was 
then sadly diagnosed with with cancer and he ended up dying at the age of 36 so even though he's massively influential in post-colonial studies and uh, marxist studies and critical theory he he didn't actually contribute uh, all that much um you know like because he was so young he could have contributed a lot more if he'd survived through and it would have been amazing to see what else he would have written about especially seeing as uh, the last video I spoke about Albert Memmi and he had the chance to write both before and after the independence movements had essentially started and, and ended in Africa and it would have been interesting to see Fanon's uh, take on how things have gone but sadly we, we don't get to we don't get to um, see any of that so we're just going to look at what he did write four books uh, one of them was pu was published after his death, and there is actually another one. It's a collection of sort of uh, essays and stuff, but I haven't included that one because uh, I don't feel like it contributes overall that much, whereas the other ones do contribute a lot. So we're going to be looking them out of order, uh, but we're going to be looking at a dying uh, colonialism, which was actually I think his second book. So yeah, we're we're immediately going to do things out of order. Uh, after that. He, he wrote, uh, of that we're going to be looking at Toward the African Revolution, which was actually the thing that, um, <laughs> that was actually the one that was published last. Uh, and then we're going to be looking at Wretched of the Earth, which was published third. And lastly, we're going to be looking at the thing that was published first, which was Black Skin, White Masks. So we'll be looking at it in that order. Um and hopefully it becomes apparent why I've chosen to do that. So let's first start off with a dying colonialism. Now, he was very involved, obviously, as you could tell with the whole work with the FLN and everything, he was very involved in actually seeing an end to uh, colonialism. And this first book, uh, while not as powerful as some of the later ones, I think it is, is good to look at um, just because he essentially talks about how... Um, how to actually fight this because he sees the war in Algeria between Algeria and France, this war for independence. He sees it as, as revealing the fact that this colonialism, this French colonialism is dying uh, and he's trying to sort of show how and he starts looking at all sorts of, of things. Uh, he, he looks at essentially various aspects so he'll look at men and women in Algeria and how they have been uh, portrayed by uh, colonization and also the, themselves how they looked at themselves um, for instance a concept which I will probably make a video on much later called the gaze he does look at this idea of the colonizer they look at the colonized and perceive them as something inferior. So the, the gaze is essentially, as a, as a very basic idea, is when a subject, so the person, then looks at another person, gazes at them, and perceives them not as a, a fellow subject, but as an object, as a thing. Uh, it's, it's essentially a sense of dehumanization. Uh, you are perceiving someone as lesser in some other sense so probably the most famous version of this which i will discuss in more depth when i actually talk about the gaze is something like the male gaze where um that is specifically originally talking about cinema in which the camera is catered to the way a man wants to see a woman so it will sexualize woman etc now this gaze is a way of um objectifying a subject of turning a subject into an object so when the colonizer looks on a colonized person as not a human, that is a way in which they are uh, subjugating them. But I will probably get much more into the concept of the gaze in general in a later in a in a later um, <clears throat> video slash audio whatever you would want to call this uh, thing I'm doing. So he also talks about in this book things like how. Um, the radio came uh, into Algeria and then the Algerians actually started using it as a way of fighting against the colonizers uh, 
Um, they did the same with medicine, which was medicine, sanitation, these kind of things were introduced in many ways and used by colonizers to colonize, but they can now be used against the colonizer. Uh, now, he does have some things here about the changes in family dynamics. Now, some aspects that I'm not sure I'm entirely on board with, uh, some somewhat more traditional viewpoints um, of things, but I'm not really going to uh, focus on that here. Um, so, yeah, this book pretty much just discusses various aspects of how colonization is dying in the country and how we need to keep pushing for, not we, but his people uh, at the time needed to keep pushing forward. And of course, Algeria did eventually become independent. So uh, it, it did ultimately work, even if it didn't, even if it didn't work as, you know, uh, as maybe preferred, like it hasn't turned out perfectly. Uh, and that's why it would be interesting to see what Fanon would have to say about uh, these uh, post-colonial states and also about neo-colonization uh, or neo-colonialism because he didn't uh, really live to see neo-colonialism. So he couldn't have commented on it, uh, of how things have changed but effectively stayed the same or worsened in some senses. Um, but yes, now... His last book, which was published after his death, was actually a collection of essays uh, called Toward the African Revolution. Now, this one has less of a unified whole as the other ones because it's a collection of essays rather than a, than a, single, um, than a single thing. But he does talk about things like how uh, all people, all of these uh, non-white people, basically, become just lumped under the same mantle. So he says, yeah... Uh, this is on uh, it's the second of these little essays called called West Indians and Africans it's page 17 he says the object of lumping all Negroes together under the designation of Negro people is to deprive them of any possibility of individual expression so it's not being like uh, oh yes there are African people from Africa there are uh, African people well West Indian people who would be African people who were in many ways taken from Africa but have developed a completely different culture external to Africa, you will just, they will lump all black people under the mantle of black people rather than understanding that there are differences between them. Uh, you often see this, as a matter of fact, in South Africa where a lot of white people do not note the distinction between different uh, black racial groups. They just go, oh no, they're all just black people. And you say, well, no, they aren't because... There are Zulu people, uh, Osa people, although I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly because I'm very, very terrible at um, the clicking sound and when to use it correctly. So yes, uh, all sorts of different groups that are just sort of seen as the same. And he notes that as something that is, is an aspect of this colonial gaze, that um, they are all seen as the same. You know, all black people are the same. There's no differences between them. And that's something he sees as um, as an issue that needs to be that needs to be looked at. Uh, now he also speaks about how the culture, the actual culture of a country, is is not. So if if say a culture is racist, it isn't because of individual people or whatever. The the, the actual culture itself is a racist culture. Um, so as I wrote here, uh, the the racist in a culture with racism. So if there's a person who's a racist, but they are in a racist culture, then that racism is completely uh, normal, right? So he says, yeah, it is not possible to enslave men. Okay, let me first say, this is on page 40 of this book, of, of my copy of it. It is not possible to enslave men without logically making them inferior through and through. And racism is not only the emotional, affective, sometimes intellectual explanation of this inferiorization. Yeah. Inferiorization. Okay, words. Uh, the racist in a culture with racism is therefore normal. He has achieved a perfect harmony of economic relations and ideology. Basically, Every colonist is a racist. If your if your country is racist, uh, 
right? If it has racist policies, then therefore you as somebody who is going along with it is also a racist. So he continues on with discussing various uh, aspects um, such as how places like Algeria faced massive amounts of torture from these uh, from these colonizers. So he says here on page uh, 66, torture in Algeria is not an accident or an error or a fault. Colonialization or colonialism cannot be understood without the possibility of torturing or violating or of massacring. Basically, it has to be there. Furthermore, torture is an expression and a means of the occupant-occupied relationship. The French police agents, who for a long time were the only ones to practice such tortures, are quite aware of this. The necessity to legitimize torture has always been considered by them to be an outrage and a paradox. So, basically, they have to torture, but they also say torture is wrong. (laughs) It is not a great system, obviously, to live under. And what what can also happen in a lot of these past uh, colonized places is that they would be colonized, but they would also, as well as being colonized, they would incorporate the colonized people into the role of colonizers, in a sense. So you would have colonized people who were acting as cops. So you would have black people subjugating other black people to torture, to all sorts of atrocious things that were done in the name of colonization. So, very fun. He also has like a, a lot of um, resentment towards like the left, uh, as in left-wing politics, because they didn't really do anything. They, When colonialism was happening, they didn't really do anything. Uh, they they would, might have said, oh, no, we're against it, but they didn't really, you know, do anything about it. They didn't actually change it. They didn't stop it. They just kind of let it happen. Um, so, fun. And now here's, here's a quote from one of his, which is very interesting in this particular sense. Because, remember, this is during the Cold War, right? This kind of, of um, independence movement were during the Cold War. So there was a big thing between you know, Russia and America having their little uh, f- pissing contest, basically, with each other. And what they would often do is have proxy wars, where they would fight through another country because America and Russia conquered a war with each other because that would lead to like World War Three, And so instead, they would just do something like, well, how about I fund one side, you fund another side, and then they fight. Like, you don't really care about that country, but that's what you do. So he says, yeah, page 94, for colonial peoples enslaved by Western nations, the communist countries are the only ones that have on all occasions taken their defense. The colonized countries need not concern themselves to find out whether this attitude is dictated by the interests of communist strategy. They note, first of all, that this general behavior is to their interest. The colonial peoples are not particularly uh, communistic, but they are irreducibly anti-colonialist. So the only people that were really helping them were the communists. And so that is why they would, you know, work more closely with the communists in the Cold War. Um, So that also then caused, you know, issues with some places. For instance, in South Africa, the uh, American government pretty much just endorsed and allowed the apartheid government to keep going because the rival, the ANC, who were the, now they are the, the major political power in South Africa, but at the time, they were the Uh, the rebellious forces that were trying to struggle against uh, apartheid and end it, they were funded in many ways by the Soviets. So apartheid became just another thing for this kind of uh, nonsense proxy war where neither side necessarily cares, but for the people that are there who are actually in the proxy war, it's very, very much important. And seeing as the communists were the ones who were helping them against the colonizers, who were capitalists, you can understand why they chose who they chose. So, yeah. Now this, as I said, doesn't really have the same kind of unity as the next two texts, which are the really big ones. Um, His most famous ones. We'll probably start with his most famous, 
Um, we will start with his most famous, the Wretched of the Earth here. Um, but as you can already see, all of this stuff is very anti-colonial. It's talking about the problems of uh, colonization and uh, drawing attention to it and trying to attack it uh, for what it is. So now we get to Fanon himself. Uh, why did I say that? Now we get to Fanon again uh, with the Wretched of the Earth. The Wretched of the Earth has there are some things I take some issue with um, in the sense that he does some he does some things um, where he will talk about certain people not so much here more so in the next book we'll look at uh, this one's more political actually i'm getting my wires crossed so actually i'll speak about that later um never mind i was i was thinking of the next book uh obviously you can tell uh by changing the order around myself i've also confused myself which is great now the wretched of the earth is pretty much a series of of chapters that discuss things about colonization and the fight against it now he starts off with a chapter suitably titled On Violence. It's pretty much the longest chapter here. Now, because, of course, as you know, uh, you should know, violence is an integral part of the fight against colonization. There were wars fought, actual wars, wars for liberation, wars for independence, Wars for the right to be a country of their own. So, as you can imagine, some people, people who are more pacifisty, do not uh, much appreciate this in the same sense. Uh, if you look at things like the, the particular philosophies of people like Gandhi or Martin Luther King Jr., they are very much focused on nonviolence. His is a bit different. He has a much more positive view of violence. That violence is something not good, but something necessary. Basically, colonization itself, not the struggle against it, but the actual thing itself, is fundamentally tied with violence. Fundamentally. And so, when they look at this violence, they say, well, the only way to really fight this is to fight it with violence violence so you need to actually use it against these people but of course there is always the danger that violence can cause uh you know problems violence can be turned against you etc etc but ultimately you need to do this so as he says here um Page 82, after years of unreality, after wallowing in the most extraordinary phantasms, the colonized subject, machine gun at the ready, finally confronts the only force which challenges his very being, colonialism. They have to fight, right? The colonizer wants compromise. They want things to be like, okay, no, no, well, it, we, we can figure this out. And the, the colonizer says, no. We want you completely out. No compromise with colonization. Now, the problem is, of course, compromise did actually ultimately happen in much of Africa, pretty much all of Africa, with colonizers. But that would be a topic for a for it would actually be a topic for someone who knows post-colonial stuff much more than I do. Um, so yeah, but now what then happens? Of course, in this um, what happens in this violence? is that the violence of the of the colonizer tends to be very, very organized and unified, right? They have an army. The colonized has to fight back with guerrilla tactics. They have to fight back in a more disorganized sense to try to actually get rid of them, right? Um, like as it says here on page 110, the arrival of the colonist uh, signified, the signified the syncretically... I think I might have written this wrong. Uh, the death of the indigenous culture, cultural lethargy, and the petrification of the individual. For the colonized, life can only materialize from the rotting cadaver of the colonist. 
So you can only have real freedom with the death of colonization. It has to be destroyed completely for there to be any kind of um, catharsis from it, from any kind of movement away from it, for, for actual healing to occur in the colonized people. So, you know, makes sense. Uh, so it makes sense why violence is then necessary, because without violence, you can't kill colonization. It, it, it's a necessary evil, essentially, in this sense. Um, because like violence, you will never say that violence is a good thing. Violence is rather a necessary thing. Um, now, in chapter 2, he speaks more about uh, this idea of spontaneity in in revolution in a sense is that there should be a a more of a a move towards revolution rather than the idea of some kind of a spontaneous movement um and, but there's always this problem when it comes to you know organizing properly is that nobody really trusts anyone else um you know uh, farm people who live in farmland don't really trust the city dwelling people and city dwelling people don't trust them back so it becomes this this issue which is further exemplified in chapter three about national consciousness that um that basically you need to build a nation in your anti-colonial movement you need to actually move away from um you need to move away from all of these these ideas of colonization and build something new out of it because that colonial framework will always exist right and we need to create a new a new people um so yeah and then chapter four uh let me just find chapter four it's the title again on national culture right so this is obviously about building up a culture of some kind for the nation and it's often looking at people like um uh writers and such um and it becomes a, a a difficult thing because how do you create a culture of a society that has never actually had its own freedom uh like he looks here like there are three stages for the colonized writer or intellectual Number one, they assimilate into Western thought and literature. Two, they move towards regression and thinking of the past, but they can't attain that. And then three, they move into praxis and try to move people towards revolutionary action. So they first try to assimilate. We need to become like the West. That doesn't actually work. So then they try to go back to the past, like a nostalgic thing, and they realize the only way to, is to go forward and move towards revolutionary action, to move towards prax uh, praxis, which is actually doing something about it. Um, so yeah, that is pretty much that. And chapter five, which I think is the last chapter. Yeah, chapter five is the last chapter. And this is the kind of thing that does actually come up in the next, well, the first book, which is going to be the last one we look at, which is more of a uh, looking at the problems, the mental problems that have been caused by people, uh, that have been caused by this, by colonization, basically. Um, there's There's all sorts of things like, uh, horrible sexual acts perpetrated by French soldiers that then caused um, obviously mental issues in the person that was, you know, abused, as you can imagine. But that's the only reason they were there was because of colonization. Uh, there was uh, like a person who survived the massacre. And ever since then, he's had like homicidal impulses. Um, a person... Uh, a person had a psychotic episode and killed someone while in that psychotic episode. Um, there were things like a European officer, so now a, colonized, a colonizer person, who then actually met one of his victims in a hospital and became depressed. These kind of things all happen. These are all like the problems that are caused by... Um, that are caused by colonization. Also, in one of the final parts, he looks at how people... Uh, have long-term psychological damage because of torture, which obviously you can imagine, torture is a bit traumatizing, but people who were like um, tortured as a precautionary measure, people who were tortured with electricity, people who were tortured with truth serum drugs, people who were tortured with um, brainwashing stuff, 
So this all becomes, you know, a um, a psychological as well as material issue for Fanon. <coughs> Uh, as as I said, Fanon was a psychiatrist, and so this is what he focused a lot on, especially when we do get to the last book, which is also the first book. It, yeah, anyway, we'll look at that one now, which is probably, to me, the best named one. Um, black Skin, White Masks, which immediately kind of tells you what it's about. It's black people who are then pretending, in a sense, to be white in, in some other way. This is also actually a beautifully written book. Uh, I, I would recommend reading Fanon just because of how, how beautifully he does write. Uh, and he writes with such fire and passion. And he's it's also rage. It's it's fury, which is... Um, like, although he says, like, right in the beginning, in his introduction, that this isn't, um, <clears throat> this isn't anger, but it is. Uh, like, this is how it starts. This is the introduction, page 11. I honestly think, however, it's time some things were said. Things I'm going to say, not shout. I've long given up shouting a long time ago. Why am I writing this book? Nobody asked me to, especially not for those for whom it was intended. So, so in all uh, serenity, my answer is that there are too many idiots on this earth. And now that I've said it, I have to prove it. Now, he talks about basically whiteness and blackness. And he does have some aspects here where I feel essentially methodological weaknesses. Um, he does a few things which I don't really agree with because he tries to, for instance, sometimes psychoanalyze entire groups of people based on, say, literature or something like that. And this kind of idea of generalizing some kind of a psychoanalytic perspective on, on a huge group of people, I think, is a bit dangerous. You know, sort of saying... Oh, uh, this entire race of people has an inferiority complex. Can be a bit generalizing. And also, of course, he was kind of using Freudian psychoanalysis, which has somewhat fallen out of favor. Uh, I also am not a fan of Freudian psychoanalysis. So there are some aspects which I do not much care for. But overarchingly, his discussion is about something real. So... Yeah, and he makes some points like here where he says, uh, page 13, the white man is locked in his whiteness, the black man in his blackness. You are what you were born as, in that sense. You can't escape it. Um, but of course, some people do try to escape it. This is this is a, a big thing. Uh, an immediate thing I can think of in South Africa, there was this basically cosmetic push for black people to use skin whitening creams and things that would lighten their skin so they would appear more white or things to make their hair more like white people hair these are the kind of things where people are encouraged to not be themselves and to try to be like the colonizer because it is perceived as better that way which is obviously awful but that is the way it has been for a long time uh, certain you know, say certain languages which is like his first chapter is about, it's called The Black Man and Language. And, like, yeah, so this is a, a quote, page 17. To speak means being able to use a certain syntax and possessing the morphology of such and such a language. But it means, above all, assuming a culture and bearing the weight of a civilization. By learning a, a language, you become part of that culture, right? And when you then take on new languages or new ways of speaking that language, you can be perceived differently. So in this sense, he says, page 18, uh, this is speaking more from his like, personal perspective, yes, I must watch my diction because that's how they'll judge me. He can't even speak French properly, they'll say with the utmost contempt. So this person, right, raised with the French language, but because, of course, he would be from a place which was a French colony, He'd be, he, he would be perceived as not a proper French person. He could never be a proper French person. And if he doesn't say, if he doesn't, you know, pronounce things correctly, then he's lower class. Uh, and then, so what happens is, the person, this, he's speaking a lot about himself, but this is like a, a, a thing that happens is a people, so a person like him, he's from a colony, he then goes to the colonizing place, 
right? So he goes to France, where he is then treated inferior because he is black. But then what happens is he comes back, right? He comes back to his native place, the colonized place. And here's from page 22. So here is our new returnee. He can no longer understand Creole. Uh, for those who don't know, Creole is basically, you know, um, a a language that is seen in some senses inferior. It's usually some kind of a hybrid language. So it mixes different languages together and becomes its own thing. Uh, so he can no longer understand Creole. So he can't understand the, the, the language of his own people anymore. He talks of the opera house, which he has probably only seen from a distance. But most of all, he assumes a critical attitude towards his fellow islanders. He reacts differently at the slightest pretext. He knows everything. He proves himself through his language. So you actually become someone who thinks that they're superior to your people because now you can speak that language, you know. Uh, but of course, that's nonsense. What all you have to do, like say South Africa is a perfect example of this. A lot of people, immigrants, um, I don't know if that noise came through, but I just got a reminder on my on my computer. Hopefully that didn't come through. If it did, I'm talking nonsense. If I didn't, I'm just talking nonsense now. If it did, apologies. So, uh, in South Africa, if you speak to a lot of immigrants, so people who have had to flee awful conditions, awful places, etc., they come here and they'll talk to you and they'll be working an awful job. But then you speak to them and it turns out that they are like an engineer or something. Like they're extremely well educated and they probably shouldn't be doing the kind of job that they're forced to do now in this country. But it's better than being back home. So he says here, page 29, when I meet a German or a Russian speaking bad French, I try to indicate through gestures the information he is asking for. But in doing so, I am careful not to forget that he has a language of his own, a country, and that perhaps he is a lawyer or an engineer back home. Whatever the case, he is a foreigner with different standards. You can't judge people based on their language. You'll see this a lot of time in South Africa with racist white people. Uh, there will be black people who obviously speak with a black accent, South African black accent. And so white people act as if that's a stupid accent. That means they're stupid. However, those black people can often speak multiple languages. English isn't even their second language. It'll be like their third, fourth, or fifth language. It's amazing that they can speak it at all. And these white people who go, oh, yeah, look, they sound so stupid because of their accent. You can probably speak one, maybe two languages, both of which will be white languages. You probably can't speak an African language. Uh, and so now you, you presume to act as if because they have an accent, they are stupider than you, which is ridiculous. So that's essentially what he is is looking at um, here, the the effects of language. But now is where it gets into some things I don't really like. Chapter two and chapter three, he psychoanalyzes people based on what they've like written. So, in literary theory, you tend to have this idea of what's called death of the author, of saying you cannot attach uh, subjective authorial meaning to the person who uh, to to the text. Like you can't read a book. And say, oh, this must mean what this must be what the, the author believes. You know, uh, it, that's like ridiculous. You know, say if you're reading a book and there's a character who's like an awful fascist, you don't read that and go, ah, oh, yes, of course, this must mean the person who wrote this is an awful fascist. Now, he kind of, now, okay, now he does choose texts that are quite um, awful in that sense, but he's essentially choosing texts very selectively. And then psychoanalyzing the author through it and saying, oh, no, because of this, you must have an inferiority complex about your race, which I don't really like. So in this particular text, for instance, it's called I am a Mart uh, Martinetian woman. Um, and in this book, it's kind of like about this this uh, black woman uh, who wants to marry a, a white guy to, like, you know, produce children that are white and everything. Now... This is a work of fiction, uh, although I think it's somewhat autobiographical, but you can't just ascribe meaning to that and say, oh, this must mean that then all black women uh, have this inferiority complex because of this what, what this one woman wrote. And that's kind of, in a sense, what uh, what he does. He's Some people might take some issue with that particular statement, but the psychoanalysis is not a really good way 
of, of analyzing a person. You, you shouldn't analyze people through, you know, a, a book they wrote because that's, that's rubbish. But he does look at something very, very sort of true. Uh, this idea that people are made to feel as if they are inferior. So like he says yeah, on page 73, it is, the, it is the racist who creates the inferior, uh, yeah, inferiorized. <sighs> Basically, the only reason that these people might feel they are inferior, why, like say, black people might believe they're inferior to white people, is because white people have made them believe that. So it is a long-term, basically, brainwashing. However, he does look at it in some senses that I just don't happen to like because, you know, it's it's psychoanalysis and he's, he's ascribing a lot of meaning uh, behind an entire race, people based on selective texts. But overall, it is a, a good point that basically uh, colonized peoples are made to believe that they are inferior to their colonizers, to the people who are, who are subjecting them to awful... Um, to just awful, uh, an, ex an awful existence. And they, they basically believe that they deserve it because, I oh know, but that I'm inferior to them because I am, you know, black, whatever. That is a, a good point that he dis declares, but it's good to just be careful of that particular kind of generalizing psychoanalysis applied to texts. It's just a, a bit of a, of a worry, um, you know, in that sense. So, he he does this with a couple of, of people and everything. Um, and he also talks about, for instance, this is an interesting one. It's under a chapter called The Black Man and Psychopathology. So here, he talks about the, fetishize, the fetishization of the black man. So, also the rain just started coming down harder. I don't know if that'll come up in the audio. Hopefully not. So, um... Uh, he talks about things like this, which is something that a lot of us do know about. The idea, there's this idea of, you know, uh, having sex with a black man. It's it's just this idea that they're, they're in some way more um, animalistic or something that it'll be like sexier. But by doing this, you are inherently being discriminatory if you, if you act that way. So... Yeah, he isn't particularly fond of this whole idea. And he says, um, yeah, on page 129, a white woman who has had sex with a black man is reluctant to take a white lover. At this is the belief, uh, at this is the belief he, we encountered, especially among white men. Who knows what they do to them? Yes, who knows? Certainly not black men. So he's like saying here, there's this idea, especially among white men, that when a uh, a woman, a white woman, has sex with a black man, oh no, now she'll never go back to, to a white man because, oh, it's just this, like, carnal, sexy fantasy to have sex with an animalistic black man, which, of course, is extremely racist. Um, but that's the way people see it. And Hai says here, you know, certainly not black men. Black men don't know what apparently black men do to white women to to make it so sexy. Um, so, yeah, it's it's a very, very uh, depressing little thing. And, uh, yeah, the rest of it, of this text, is mostly just kind of reinforcing some of these same kind of ideas. Um, and the idea that, you know, the the colonizer requires the colonized to exist, for him to exist. They, they can't be a colonizer without a colonized. So they have to maintain this uh, forever, pretty much, uh, or as long as they can. Um, but he says here in, in chapter 8, which is called By Way of Conclusion, which obviously is a, is a conclusion, he says here, page 171, the black man, however sincere, is a slave to the past. So you can't really make that claim that a lot of, you know, white conservatives like to say, oh, well, like slavery ended the uh, 150 years ago. We, we can't, you can't expect us to keep blah, 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 that whole thing. A colonized, the colonized people are forever a slave to that, to that legacy, um, that legacy of slavery and colonization. It will never go away. 
um, and it will affect you for a long time. Like these kind of beliefs don't just go away because you know time has passed. Like you get a lot of people who still believe that certain races are inferior to other races. People still believe that nonsense. That isn't because of some new idea. That's an old idea, and it's not something that's going to go away easily. And he sort of one of the last lines is is somewhat more hopeful, and he says, page one seventy six. Why not simply try to touch the other, feel the other, discover each other? Now, by that, by saying touch each other, it's not in like a sexual sense, but trying to actually understand the other people, right? Don't just don't just accept that there's another person. Oh, yeah, that's the black person. Try to actually understand that person. Try to feel them. Try to discover them. Try to actually understand them rather than essentially just being a racist. Uh, so, yeah. That is, uh, that's Franz Fanon. Um, some aspects I don't really like, you know, the whole um, pathologizing an entire race of people based on the text of a few. That isn't great, but his overall uh, work and a lot of, pretty much all of his political stuff is fantastic and it has a lot of fire to it. And it, it is something that I think if you have any interest in, dismantling these kind of power structures like it can still these can still be applied to uh, a more modern uh, anti-neo-colonial and anti-capitalist framework so Franz Fanon I would definitely say is worth reading more so just those two texts I would say if you're really really interested you could read everything but I would say recommended reading would pretty much be um, the uh, black skin white masks and the wretched of the earth the other two you can read, but they don't have quite as much of a unified whole as the others. Um, and I don't think they have as much uh, applicability as they're quite contextual in, in that sense. But yes, I would definitely recommend them. So check them out. And I think I'm going to finish off here and just say goodbye. And uh, you can look at all my stuff in the description uh, if you want to find any of my like YouTube stuff or interviews or etc. Uh, yeah. And you can also do all those usual things that like, comment, uh, share stuff. Do it. Okay, I'm going to go now. Bye. I hope that this was somewhat informative. I felt it was a bit rambly at times. I don't know if I'm very happy with this one. But um, yeah. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Goodbye.